Uh, I want to jump straight into it. And I just want to say from the onset, this is not a video or a message to by any by any means demean or speak ill of anybody in the body of Christ. I think that Tasha Cobbs is one of our generation's greatest gifts and I appreciate her music. Her ministry has blessed me a lot over the years. We listened to her music a lot. We even, I think last Sunday, sang one of her songs in our worship set. And so I have nothing but respect for Tasha Cobbs and what she's trying to do for the Lord. But I also want to, I guess, fulfill my duty as a pastor and a minister. And my motivation for making this is not to start or stir up controversy or to add fuel to a controversy, which is already brewing, but really is to provide biblical clarity to the people, number one, whom I pastor, and the people like yourselves who are out there who may be confused by some of the things that you've been seeing, these different trends in the body of Christ over the past few years. Uh, I've been praying about saying something for about a month now, so this isn't something that I decided to do yesterday or today even. Uh, but really, for the past several years, and especially in this last month or so, I felt an increased burden from the Holy Spirit to uh, really address some of the trends that we see in the body of Christ. There are some very alarming things that are happening, but there's also some good things. But I think, again, going to the Bible, uh, if we can all agree, at least those of you who are Christians can agree that the Bible still is the foundation for what we do, what we believe, and uh, how we govern in the church. And so... Over the last past month, let me give you guys kind of my backdrop story here, uh, and I think that will give a context for why I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and hopefully some of you who are in a place of confusion will get some clarity. But for starters, I was delivered from demons, and I know that's kind of a uh, taboo thing to talk about. I remember deliverance ministry. I remember actually I was watching um, a DVD when I was in college. This was years and years ago. Uh, from a guy by the name of G. Craig Lewis, who did a series of DVDs called The Truth Behind Hip Hop. And in these DVD series, he basically unveiled the demonic uh, nature and spirit behind hip hop. And for me, at the time, I was a Christian who thought it was no problem to listen to Fred Hammond, back in the day, Fred Hammond, you know, Marvin Sapp, C.C. Wines. And on the other hand, listen to Jay-Z, or at the time, the rappers who were popular were like people like Little Little Wayne and 50 Cent. This is this tells you how old I am, right? Well, anyway, I remember, and I can only tell you all this because it's my testimony, but what happened to me was when I was 19 years old, I was playing college basketball, went on a road trip with my team uh, up to Chicago in the Apple Store in Chicago. Uh, was one of the few Apple stores in the country, so I was excited, bought my first iPod, and I needed music on my iPod, so I asked some of my teammates to, um, you know, put some of their music on my new iPod. I was so excited. So I was going to sleep, and they put all this rap music on my iPod. And I was going to sleep and um, listening to this music. Now, not long after that, the Holy Spirit really began to convict me about the music I was listening to. And it started really with the dream that I had. And let me tell you this dream, which was the most bizarre dream I've ever had. In the dream... I was in hell, and they were playing this music in the background of hell. There was a party going on in hell, but it was like the weirdest thing because there were demons that were dressed like hip hoppers, you know, back in the day again, baggy jeans, Timberland boots, jerseys, the whole, you know, early 2000s hip hop era. And there was this scene of, of a party, like a club, but it just felt so oppressive and dark. And I was in this uh, prison cell in the dream, and I was screaming for someone to help me. And at the time, I just didn't understand these demons were like gargoyle looking creatures. They were like 20 feet tall and I was terrified, but they were dancing. They were playing this music. They were listening specifically to Jay-Z. And um, I remember in the dream crying out for help. And long story short, I see my mother and the youth pastor of my church at the time uh, who are coming to me and they're in full bright colors. Everyone else and everything else in the dream was complete darkness and gray. And so anyway... They get to the prison cell, and they say, you're not even locked in here. The door is unlocked. It's up to you to leave. And I was like, wow. All this time, I thought I was in prison, and I um, was actually behind an unlocked cell. And so the Lord used that dream to show me that there's certain behaviors and certain practices of life that 
may or may not be judged as sinful by the masses, but for me, they were behaviors that were keeping me in bondage. And for me, namely, that was listening to that music. I was feeding my soul with complete filth every day, listening to this music and wondering why I was having a battle in my walk with God to be holy. You know, one day I wanted, like Paul said in Romans, I've been reading Romans this week, but Paul wrestles uh, with his flesh and his spirit. And he said, man, my spirit wants to do God's will. My flesh wants to do the will of the flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And that was kind of my predicament. But I had this war raging in my members because I was receiving impartation from two sources, from light and from dark. I would go to church on Sunday or spend time even by myself reading the Bible. And I would be filled with the light or filled with the truth. And then I would go and I would listen to this music. And I would be filled with darkness. And so I had this, this wrestle going on, and I was inconsistent. And the scripture says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so I was literally bound by double-mindedness, and I was ineffective uh, in my pursuit toward holiness because I would take, you know, like two steps forward, 20 steps backwards. I was always in this rut of sin. I just had these things in my life that never went corrected. And largely due to the type of media that I was consuming, the music, the movies, just this carnal lifestyle. And so the Lord taught me early on that you have to be separated from the world. And I began to read my Bible and uh, just begin to stumble, stumble upon scriptures such as have no fellowship with darkness. You know, the scripture says it very clearly. It says have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness. The scripture says in James chapter 4, 4, uh, do not be friends with the world. That friendship with the world is enmity against God. The scripture very clearly shows this, this distinct contrast between a holy life and an unholy life. And so I saw the fruits of holiness as I began to deprogram, detach, and, you know, declutter my soul of all the world. You know, first John chapter two tells us that you cannot have the love of the father and have the love of this world. And I love the world. I love the fashion of the world. I love the media of the world. I love the, uh, the things that the world said were fun or enjoyable, namely partying, alcohol, smoking, that whole lifestyle. I had a love for that. And I was wondering why I couldn't experience the love of God. So going to the Bible, and if you guys read the caption on this video or the heading on this video, I'm not interested really in trying to side up with preachers who are really more concerned about a platform and an opportunity or maintaining friendships with their carnal friends. Uh, I want to side up with the Bible. And too many of you guys are looking to uh, or validating these beliefs that certain things are okay simply because a famous preacher said it. Well, if so-and-so said it, then it must be okay. Well, I want to use the Bible and I would encourage you to use your Bible. If you have a Bible, please go get one if you don't. But make the Bible the place of authority in your life. Not what a famous person says or what your favorite preacher or singer says. So anyway, that's kind of the backdrop of the story of why I'm passionate about this. And if you remember back in the 90s, Kirk Franklin got into a lot of trouble with the church world because he did collaborations with secular artists. He did songs uh, that were pretty neutral. I mean, there was nothing super sinful, we would say, about the song lyrics or the context, nothing too ratchet or raunchy. But he was kind of a trailblazer, and he opened up the church to a new paradigm of, of what is possible. And really, from the time that Kurt Franklin broke the mold and began to step out and do that, we've seen this whole wave of, of people who have... Um, begin to embrace collaborations with worldly artists. Now, there's a lot that can be said about that topic as a whole. In recent times, Lecrae, uh, the, fa the famous Christian rapper Lecrae, has come under a lot of heat because he's made collaborative songs with different artists and produced you know, different music with secular producers. And so this debate is raging. And also, some of you may not know this, but really soon here, I think even before the year's over, uh, if not before the year's over, sometime early next year, Snoop, Snoop Doggy Dog, you got it, Mr. Smoking, Drinking, Straight West Coasting, Snoop Doggy Dog, uh, Mr. Uh, Weed himself is producing a gospel album. Now, I heard someone tell me recently that Snoop was saved and born again, and I said, well, hey, God can save anybody. I used to be a drinker, a smoker, a liar, too, um, so maybe Snoop is saved. So I went to Snoop's Twitter page in the midst of this conversation. Yeah, somebody say, what? I don't believe it either. So I go to Snoop's Twitter page, and what has Snoop's Twitter page got? Nothing but pictures of him with blunts in his hand, 
and shots of liquor and curse words and just the same old Snoop Dogg that you've known since the early 90s. There's no measurable change. There's no fruit of righteousness, right? None whatsoever. I mean, I'm sorry. You can call it judging. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just observing. And there's a big difference between judging somebody and observing. Jesus said that we are to judge by the fruit. So I have to observe the fruit of your life. If you come to me and you tell me that you love God, but you have no fruit or evidence of loving God in your life, I'm biblically allowed to question the legitimacy of your uh, salvation based on what Jesus taught and what the Bible says. Now, if I come to you judging you uh, and you have fruit in your life and I come to you accusing you of not being real or being lukewarm and there's no reason for that, then, yeah, that may be under the category of judgment. But we have to stop ignoring what Jesus taught. We judge the tree by the fruit that it bears. So anyway, let me speed this up and I'm going to get into Tasha Cobbs in one one minute. So over the last month, I've I've been praying about this a lot. I want you guys to know that everything I'm saying is birthed out of prayer, out of Bible study, and um, out of sincere contemplation, conversation with other people. And so I'm not saying this again because I have anything personal against Tasha Cobbs or anybody else like her who would do the types of things that she's doing. But I'm grieved for the church. You know, the scripture in Jude tells us to contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And in this generation, there is an all-out war for the truth of the gospel, the call to surrender all, to deny yourself, to take up your cross, to follow Jesus. is not a message that's being preached. There's very few people warning you about the lake of fire, about the eternal judgment. In fact, most new believers have never even heard these concepts. And I was talking to my wife earlier today, and I was telling her, I said, you know, I read the epistle of Romans. I read the book of Romans this week, and Paul begins this epistle applauding the church at Rome, saying that your the testimony of your faith has gone throughout the world. Like, you guys have a reputation for being, you know, vigilant, on fire, sold out believers. But yet and still, Paul the Apostle says, I still need to explain the gospel to you. So a systematic theology is formed in Romans 1 through 16, where Paul, beginning in chapter 1 all the way through, lays out line upon line, the process of salvation, the explanation for the need for a savior. I mean, it's a beautiful, uh, instructive manual for deliverance, for freedom of the gospel. But he's writing this to a people who are, even though they're zealous, they're ignorant. And I believe that that's kind of the condition for our generation. There's a generation of zealous people who you are on fire for the Lord, but when it comes to gospel truth, biblical truth, you are ignorant. And what happens a lot of times is that in the body of Christ, a person becomes famous and we, you know, we equate fame to authority. And there's a huge difference there. Just because a person's famous doesn't mean that they know what they're talking about. Just because a person's famous doesn't mean that they have spiritual authority. Tasha Cobbs, Lecrae, these are worship leaders and rappers. They are not leaders in the body of Christ. They have a mega platform where they can reach millions of people. But that doesn't mean that what they say is biblically accurate. And so what people typically do is follow the famous people and they ignore the God-ordained or appointed leaders in the church. And I think that that's error number one, that number one, we don't want to judge Tasha Cobbs as a false teacher because she's not a teacher. I don't want to judge her as a false prophet because she's not a prophet. The Lord may use her to lead people into some sort of revelation or truth, but she's just a singer. I mean, she's not a, a, a leader in the body of Christ. She has influence but there's a difference, again, between spiritual authority and just being a famous singer. She couldn't sing. No one would know who she is. That's just the nature of America for you. So we need to understand that, that Tasha Cobbs is not a false teacher. She just is not a teacher. You need to know that. So, okay, now let me, let me dive into it. Let me offend you. Let me uh, cause myself to never get invited to speak at anybody's event or church ever again after I say what I'm about to say. 100% I categorically, without hesitation, reservation, am absolutely opposed to Nicki Minaj and Tasha Cobb's collaboration and Lecrae and his collaboration. And here is why. Point number one, because it sends a bad, sets a bad example of what holiness is to the body of Christ. I pastor a church which is a average sized church, a few hundred people. And I've gotten dozens of emails from different members of the church asking me, what's up with that? Because we revere Tasha Cobbs as a worship leader. We honor and respect her ability to lead people into worship. And when they saw that she made a song with Nicki Minaj, 
who literally is the queen. And I'm not exaggerating. She is the queen of Ratchet, okay? Some of you out there say, how dare you talk about Nikki like that? The song that she just released today, Rake It Up, is a song with a bunch of half-naked women booty bouncing across the screen. She is literally releasing filth to the world. So you guys can stay on that boat and talk about that I'm being religious all you want to or that I am grumpy or bitter or whatever. But I'm telling you, you cannot have mixture in the body of Christ. And there is so much confusion as a result of these decisions. Point number two, and this is probably going to hurt some of your feelings, but these famous singers and famous preachers don't do what they do usually for free. I hope you understand there is a financial incentive for doing this. iTunes, for example, will pay you between 7 to $10 for every album that you sell on their platform, which means if you want to be a millionaire, all you've got to do is find somebody or a way to get your album out there and you become a millionaire overnight. Nicki Minaj is featured on a song which is like eight and a half, nine minutes long, and she's only rapping for about 45 seconds. I listened to the song, and she's not rapping about anything that has anything to do with the song. She's literally talking about how she went from food stamps to being rich, okay? And amen. So the financial incentive is what we need to be honest about. People always try to use... Um, oh, I'm being an evangelist or I'm trying to disciple somebody or I'm trying to love them where they're at as an excuse to cover up their real motive. I'm not accusing Tasha Cobbs of this, but I'm just saying it's a very real possibility that Tasha Cobbs and Lecrae and all these different people, they want to tap into a market. They want their base to expand. Why? Because they want to make more money. You notice the CD's not free, okay? So... Again, I'm not, again, assuming that about them, but I'm saying it's a very real po uh, possibility. Third reason why I'm totally opposed to this, and I hope I'm not making y'all too mad, but the third reason I'm totally opposed to this is because as a pastor, I understand the very real need for people to live a holy life. And when people they look up to are embracing lifestyles or people that promote lifestyles that are unholy, it causes confusion in the local church. And so now the authority of the local pastor or the leader is usurped because, of course, we'd rather listen to a famous person or follow the example of a famous person than listen to what our grumpy pastor has to say. And so we begin to question everything that our actual leaders tell us. And that's only if you have a leader who's going to tell you the truth. But when I when I do deliverance, like our church is a deliverance church, okay? And some of you guys need to get hip to deliverance ministry. It's the exorcism, exercising of devils, okay? One of the main reasons why people need deliverance is because they have soul ties. And people think that soul ties are just with sexual partners from your past or your current uh, love life. But a soul tie can often be even with a person you don't know or have never met in real life. There are people who have shrines to Beyonce and Nicki Minaj and your, your heroes in your bedroom. You don't call it a shrine. You don't burn incense in front of it like the Hindus do. But you've got posters. You've got T-shirts. You've got coffee mugs with their picture. You've got their their perfumes. You've got all this these memorabilia dedicated to this celebrity. And you literally wake up listening to them. You go to sleep listening to them. You have a soul tie. You know everything about their life because you watch their biography. You've read their biography. You've listened to all their albums. You've memorized all their song lyrics. You think you know them and you've never even met them. You have a soul tie. And so we end up doing deliverance ministry for people. What happens almost, I would say at least 50% of the time is that the deliverance cannot happen until a person renounces a soul tie. And oftentimes, a soul tie is with a person that they simply just listen to their music. There are people that I, I was I was praying for a young lady not that long ago who, who literally was obsessed with Beyonce. She wanted to look like Beyonce, do her hair like Beyonce, talk like Beyonce, uh, act like Beyonce, look like every way she could. She wanted to be like Beyonce, was not even putting half that effort into being like Jesus, but wanted to be like Beyonce. And there's people out there like Nicki Minaj who have these cult-like followings. And it's not because they're promoting Jesus. It's not because they're promoting holiness. It's because they are literally empowered by demons to release uncleanness to the masses. Now, is Nicki Minaj saved? I don't know. Hopefully, she will be if she's not. Maybe she's inching her way toward the kingdom. I've read some things where she, you know, out of her mouth professes to believe in the existence of God. But again, believing in the existence of God 
uh, is not the same as following and serving that God. So based on the fruit and based on what she said, based on what we can observe, there's no biblical evidence that Nicki Minaj has been born again. And just because some of you guys are carnal and you want to believe it with all your heart or because Tasha Cobb said it or your favorite preacher prophesied one day that Nicki Minaj would be saved, you guys are in error, okay? And you worship men. I just want to be honest. You need to burn the idol of the man and the woman that you worship and stop allowing yourself to be poisoned with soul ties. You need to understand that, first of all, the Lord is jealous and the Lord is jealous for glory, okay? So... God is not going to share his glory with anybody. And when a person has truly been converted, what happens is that their heart is humbled. If a person comes to Jesus Christ and is aware of their sin, it is not uncommon. It's actually normal for that person to weep over the fact that they've sinned, that they've broken the law of God. And that person will probably weep with joy when they have the revelation of the grace of God that they've been saved and washed from their sin. When people get saved, they turn their back on the world. This is old-fashioned stuff that you guys in this generation are not hearing. To be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, means you turn your back on the world. It means that you have nothing to do with your former conduct, the sin that you committed in your past. You do not embrace it. You do not promote it. You do not celebrate it. You actually are called biblically to hate it. So if a person is not saved, if we have no evidence to believe that the person is born again, why would a preacher, why would a singer, why would anybody with the platform invite ungodly people or ungodly, well, I'll just put it like this, person who practices ungodly things onto their platform? It is a serious error in judgment. Now, some of you guys say, well, you just don't know. You're being critical. God is working behind the scenes. Listen, I've been behind the scenes, okay? I don't try to strut my stuff, but I actually know people in high places. And I've shaken, shook hands with a lot of famous rich people, and I know a lot more people than you probably think I do. I've been behind the scenes, okay? And I'll tell you, there is the most rampant, widespread corruption. And it's not just in the secular music industry. It's in the supposed gospel music industry. I, I, I could tell you guys stories that would completely just disintegrate all hope, but I don't want to do that. But what I want to tell you is basically like this, man. God is coming back for a bride that's pure and spotless without blemish. And some of you guys are so worried about disagreeing with your leaders, disagreeing with uh, people who have influence because you don't want to be excommunicated or you know pushed out of the inner circle. Let me tell you something. You have one God, one Lord. Serve him. Quit trying to get in with the church crowd. The church is, is carnal, okay? The church is full of corruption. And some of you preachers are so worried about getting invited to somebody's church, getting an honorarium, becoming famous, getting your name on somebody's stupid flyer, that you will compromise everything the Bible teaches just to get a platform. You are the problem in America. We need to get back to the Bible. So again, this book right here, this is a Bible. This has to be the, the measure of truth in your life, not what your favorite preacher says, not what your favorite singer says. And you guys, let me just talk to you about the role of worship particularly, okay? Our church, again, there's thousands of churches like this all over the world, but there is something that the Lord is doing through worship music that's literally changing the environment of cities. And, and historically, you can see it through the Bible, you see it through church history, that God has been jealous for pure worship. So I was thinking of Tasha Cobbs, and I was thinking about the story of Samson. And some of you are familiar with Samson in the book of Judges, chapter 13 uh, through 16, I believe it is. Samson was a Nazarite, and the Lord raised him up to bring about deliverance, okay? So Samson, mighty Samson, you know the story, maybe the, the Samson of the Bible was called to be a Nazarite, long hair, and long story short, he allowed Delilah in on his secret of his strength, which was his hair, she cut his hair, and he lost his strength, and he was taken captive, and his eyes were gouged out. It's a pretty sad story. There's a redemptive part of the story, but here's the thing that the Lord showed me, that Samson, if you read it, there are several times where Samson like plays the game with the anointing. It's like he toys with Delilah. And he continues to like put her on this 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 little hunt, you know, where she you gotta read it for yourself in Judges 13 through 16. But there comes like a, a time where it says that after Samson is bound, that he goes to shake himself, and it says that he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. In other words, it was a gradual decline of the anointing. It was not over the top once 
once he sinned one time, it was like you lost it. It was like a perpetual thing. Like you just were degraded little by little. And before long, it says that he went to shake himself. And the scripture says he did not know that the Lord had departed. And my fear for Tasha Cobbs, my fear for Lecrae, my fear for all of these these carnal preachers is that because the gift and the calling of God does not come like without repentance, you can still be gifted. You're a gifted speaker. You can still prophesy and you're still called to even have influence and you have a mandate on your life, but you're losing the anointing. And and I just want to say that just because you put one track on the song doesn't mean that all the other songs are bad. But I'm telling you, this is a recipe for disaster. There will come a day where not only is Nicki Minaj and people like her welcome in the church, but the church will begin singing Nicki Minaj's songs. I want to predict that will happen, okay? I'm not going to say I'm prophesying, but let me predict that it won't be long that the church will actually be singing Nicki Minaj's songs. I saw a video, some of you guys know the comedian Kev on stage, about two, three weeks ago, he posted a video of a young uh, young adult service at a church where they were doing some sort of dance uh, to a Jay-Z song in the church with curse words flying through the, through the air, throwing money in the air. I mean, this is in a church. And so what I'm saying is this is dangerous because it's opened the door to no standard. And so now we have a generation of young people who are completely confused. Your preacher's going to get up there on Sunday morning and tell them, hey, don't listen to this worldly stuff. Live a holy life set apart unto God. And then they're going to go download the new album from their favorite worship leader. And she's going to do a feature song with the most ratchet rapper in the entire nation and probably in the whole world. Now, Nikki, please come to Jesus and somebody please tell Nikki Minaj what it means to be saved. But at this current moment, while you're releasing Rake It Up and bouncing your booty all over the world, the church is being confused. Now, I just had to be honest with you guys and say it how it is because you guys don't apparently appreciate truth. But I'm going to tell you the truth anyway. So this confusion is dangerous. This confusion is sending people to hell. And it's what causes people to to lose hope in God. At the end of the day, it's like, you know, when Jesus was in Luke chapter four at the top of the mountain, it says that Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And he said, bow down to me and I'll give you all these things. He said, it's been committed into my hands and I give it to whomever I will. All you've got to do is worship me. All you've got to do is submit to my system, my kingdom, my way of doing things. And when gospel artists, preachers, and saints, people who profess to be saints, bow their knee to the spirit of this world and compromise you lose everything. You lose your inheritance. Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He could have took a shortcut toward fame or toward power, but that would have been a trap door from Satan had he bowed his knee in Luke chapter 4. Because now we know that the kingdoms of this world, there's a day coming when Jesus Christ will be enthroned and all nations will worship him. But had he taken that shortcut toward fame, he would have forfeited his destiny. And I believe there's many people like Tasha Cobbs, like Lecrae, uh, and some of the others who are not that famous, but they're just as guilty, who are literally being offered the kingdoms of this world. They're being offered more fame, more reach, and the church empowers it. And they say, well, you get to be more evangelistic. You have a greater platform, a greater audience. You'll be able to reach more people for Jesus. And after all, Jesus was a friend of sinners, and so you should just embrace it. But you're forfeiting your real eternal inheritance. You cannot serve two masters. And so for the ones out there who are confused, that confusion is not because the devil's confusing you. It's because the Lord is convicting you. And he's saying, listen, you guys have my spirit inside of you, okay? And you have a radar that's probably going off. There's a blaring red light blowing up in your spirit saying something don't seem right with this. That's the Holy Spirit. Woe to the preacher who would try to convince you that the compromise is okay. All of these guys, listen, I know a lot of these guys, okay, and I'm not trying to put nobody on blast, but let me tell you the truth about some of these preachers who you guys greatly admire. They don't care about you, okay? They don't care about your soul. They don't care about the truth of the gospel. They are interested in themselves. They preach for expensive fees. They won't even preach for less than several thousand. They got to fly first class. They got to stay in the five-star hotel. They are not laborers for the harvest. They are hired preachers who are gifted. And they don't care about the soul of anybody. They're trying to build their mega church. They're trying to compete with the church down the street. They're trying to promote themselves. Everything is about them and their glory, their money, their congregation. They have no heart for souls. If you love people like Nicki Minaj, love them enough to tell them the truth. 
Tell them what the scripture says. In Hebrews chapter 12, 14, it says, Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Tell them what James 4, 4 says, that friendship with the world is enmity against God. You cannot be a friend of the world. Whoever makes himself a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's in the Bible. You cannot have fellowship with darkness. Hate the garment defiled by the flesh. Tell them that if you love them so much. Now, here's the last thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to get off here before I get myself in trouble. But this whole concept that Jesus was friend to sinners, you know, that's the one you hear all the time. Well, Jesus wasn't about the religious. He wasn't about the Pharisees. He was about the sinners, and he came to seek and save that which was lost. Exactly. Seek and save that which was lost. He said it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. Well, if you're a doctor and you go to somebody... You need to give them the medicine of the gospel. You're not supposed to go and hang out and endorse or condone their lifestyle. Now, I'm not saying Tasha Cobbs is doing that with Nicki Minaj. But what I'm trying to tell you is that many of you guys out there, you're so concerned with being relevant and fitting in. And the reason why you put so much emphasis on relevance and fitting in is because you do not have the anointing. If you were anointed by the Holy Spirit when you spoke, when you prayed, when you preached, yokes would be destroyed. But because you don't pray, you live a carnal life, you don't know your Bible, you don't fear God, you have to rely on the arm of the flesh. And so you have to fit in and blend in so that when you go out there to minister, you're able to build a bridge with the people. And so people have this notion that like, if I just like, just wear the clothing, talk the talk, enjoy the music, hang out at the nightclub, that somehow I'll be a great evangelist. That is a unbiblical, that's, that's like heresy just about. And so some of you guys, again, you need to go to the Lord and pray. You need to seek God and repent. Like there's people who are probably furious with what I'm saying right now, but don't be mad at me. I'm shining the light. If you don't have nothing to hide, then it doesn't matter. But the problem is there's far too many people out there these days who do not fear God. They don't read their Bible. They have no understanding of it if they do graze the scriptures from time to time. And I'm telling you guys this, that yes, Tasha Cobbs is anointed. I said at the beginning, if you tuned in late, listen to my earlier statements. I love her ministry. I love what she stood for for all these years. But at the end of the day, Tasha Cobbs is not God. And you who are Christians out there, your Bible needs to instruct your worldview, not what your favorite preacher says, not even me. If I tell you something that's not in the book, then throw it in the garbage. But go to your Bible. See if you can find a biblical case for a person doing what these rappers and what these singers and even what these preachers are doing. You know, it's like even there's this video that's circulating right now on Facebook of Louis Farrakhan who he was at a church a couple days ago, I guess, or recently they posted this video where Louis Farrakhan, who's the leader of the Nation of Islam here in America, was saying that, you know, I know that my Redeemer lives and that Jesus, you know, is going to save me. And so this was like, wow, you know, Farrakhan, is Farrakhan saved now? He's seemed like he's changing his tune after all these years. Well, the very next day, Farrakhan posts a video talking about Allah, okay? So what I'm saying is, you guys, we have to be honest, okay? Stop trying to get an open door and get invited to a secular platform and be a light. Be a prophet or shut up. Be a real prophet or shut up. Stop asking for thousands of dollars every time you preach or sing and be a prophet, okay? America needs prophetic voices, not people that are trying to uh, make money off the gospel or trying to be famous because of what they sing or preach. And if you guys again, have issue with what I'm saying, my only challenge to you would be go to your Bible. Go to your Bible and build a case for what you believe from the Bible, not from what somebody says. I pray that, that God uses Nicki Minaj in the days to come, and I pray that she does have an encounter, just like I had an encounter when the Lord set me free. But I refuse to co-sign or be silent. It's kind of like this race issue almost. When this racism happened or is happening in the news, you see all this stuff in the news, Black people especially speak up, oh, it's a shame how silent white people are about racism. It's a shame. Where is the white leadership speaking out against white supremacy? Why aren't they saying anything, right? And we judge their entire walk with God because they're not vocal about racism. But I have a greater question. When we see compromise and people who are completely going against the grain of biblical, historic Christianity, and we don't say a word, where is the compromise in that? Do you see it? 
So again, I'm just telling you guys that the gospel music industry is not a gospel music industry. It's a music industry which markets off the gospel people of this country. They get paid from y'all, but they're not preached. Their aim is money, okay? And I hate to keep saying that, but you need to hear it again. The aim is money. Next time you try to have an event and you want to invite one of these famous people, ask them how much they charge. If you get an answer less than 15000 or 10000 I would be shocked. Because they are paid professionals. You need to understand this is marketing. If I'm a gospel singer and I want album sales and I want to drive people to my website and I want to make my album go number one, what am I going to do? I'm going to stir the pot a little bit. And so some of you guys out there, you have been got and you don't even know it. But all I'm telling you is, and my concluding remarks, is go to your Bible and read it. Read the book of Romans. Here's my Bible challenge for anybody that wants to know what God says about it. Read the book of Romans, chapter 1, all the way through 16. Go read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, read Ephesians, read Galatians, read all of it. And then, after you read your Bible, then come back and have an answer. So, again, you guys who are out there understand that because you love the world, that what I'm saying to you in your carnal mind, the things of the Spirit are foolishness to you. But I refuse to go down with this generation of compromised preachers and compromised people who refuse to stand up for the truth. There is a day coming when God's going to judge this world in righteousness and in truth. And when you have opened the door to the world, in the church, in the world, I have become one, we have a problem. So again... There is a day coming when Nicki Minaj, I pray, will be a vocal, outspoken woman of God who calls millions of people into a relationship with Jesus Christ as she testifies. I don't believe that's impossible. I'm praying for that. I'm praying for Justin Bieber. I'm praying for Katy Perry. I'm praying for all of them. And I believe that God has a heart to save all of them just like he saved us. But at some point, you guys have to draw a line. And for my, and my last, say, last thing I'm going to say is to the leaders out there and to the pastors out there, listen, some of you guys are associated with compromised leaders, okay? And some of you feel the peer pressure from your contemporaries to actually be silent about these kind of things. But let me remind you that the famous preacher that you are riding the coattails of, they did not save you, okay? And the people in your church who you're worried about them leaving and not giving in the offering tomorrow, they did not build that church or start that church. So if you're going to be a prophet, then be a prophet. If you're not going to tell the truth, then stop preaching. Retire. Put your Bible in a drawer and go hide in a cave because the world doesn't need hypocritical preachers. The world needs truth tellers. People that pray, people that know the word, people that stand in the counsel of God, and people that love enough to tell the truth. If you love someone, don't sugarcoat their sin or condone it. Tell them the truth. Your being nice to people is killing them. We need prophets to tell the truth. So I hope that clarified my position. If you have any questions, you can feel free to inbox me or email me. I will get back to you at my earliest convenience. But God bless you all. And if I made you mad, I don't care because I love you enough to tell you the truth. Goodbye.